Hey everyone, this is Janis again, the session chair for room four today. Uh, I have Sam Thurstfield, uh, apologies. Yeah, that's it. Oh. Hello. <laughs> Hello, nice meeting you. Um, you're going to talk about generating different base systems from the same inputs in Freedesk SDK today. So, I as well take it away. Good luck. Okay, thank you. Um, it's great to see packaging con. It's nice to see a lot of people brought together to talk about the same thing. About me, I am an occasional contributor to the free desktop SDK. I'm not a core contributor, but I'm very impressed by what's been built. And so I want to share it. Um, I work for CodeThink. They're giving me the time to plan and do this talk. So thanks for that. You might be thinking, you might be thinking, where's the next slide? So. What is the free desktop SDK? Well, it's not a distribution and it doesn't have packages, but it does a lot of things that a distribution does. Specifically, it builds container images, which are used by desktop apps. So the main use case is the Flatpak app packaging system for Linux, for Linux apps. So you could compare the free desktop SDK to um, cloud build tools in a way like Docker build or Linux kit or to embedded build tools like Buildroot and Yocto. But it doesn't share any heritage with those. It's producing several different artifacts, Flatpak, Runtime and SDK. There's some work in progress to build the same thing for Snap, which is another app packaging technology. It builds container images, which work with Docker and Podman. And it can even build virtual machines. These are only for testing. They're not things you would use on a real workstation, but it can build working VM images. So that's one half of it. The other half is it's a small volunteer powered project. So there's not a huge investment behind it. It's maintained, I think, completely by volunteers at the moment. And what I want to talk about is how the free desktop SDK has achieved what they've achieved with a small investment and low ongoing effort. So like I said, the main use case of the free desktop SDK is the Flatpak app sandboxing tool. So if you run a Linux desktop and you run Spotify or Steam or something like that, then maybe you use Flatpak. There's a stable release of the SDK every year. Um, they release for two architectures, 64-bit um, ARM and 64-bit Intel. There's a, inside the 64-bit Intel is a 32-bit system, which is also built. That's mainly to run 32-bit Steam games, I think. And it's also tested sometimes on RISC-V and PowerPC, but the, um, the Flathub website where Flatpak apps are generally distributed doesn't have the capacity to build everything for RISC-V and PowerPC at this point. So it's not, that's, that's possible, but it's not being used. So a lot of apps don't use the free desktop SDK directly. They will use one of the SDKs that's built on top of it, such as the GNOME SDK or the KDE SDK. So these imagine a stack at the bottom. The free desktop SDK is an image containing low level tools everybody needs, such as a compiler and various shared libraries. And then the GNOME SDK has that plus all of the standard GNOME libraries and the KDE SDK, you, you may be able to guess. Okay. How much do people use it? Looking at the stats for the last release, which was only August of this year, there's been over a million downloads already. If you go back, then older releases have had multiple millions of downloads. So this isn't an academic project. This is a real world project that's being used in anger and in happiness as well. So the question I wanna answer, how do you integrate thousands, well, not thousands, hundreds of components, multiple architectures, release every year, millions of users without going crazy? And the answer of course is good tooling and lots of automation. Let's start with the tooling. The free desktop SDK uses a build tool called BuildStream, which 
is relatively new. It was first around in 2017, I think. And build stream has some nice characteristics. So I hope everybody is doing sandbox builds in 2021. It's almost 2022. I hope everyone's working towards reproducible builds. But BuildStream makes it very easy to do. In fact, it doesn't give you the option. If you run a build, it will set up a, a container and control everything that goes into the container. That means the output can be reproduced later on a different computer even because all you need is to know all the inputs and you can produce the same output. And it's traceable because we control all the inputs so we know every dependency that went in so we can later look at a built artifact and say okay this was built with exactly these build instructions exactly these sources and we know where it came from also this allows good caching if you can trust that your artifacts are reproducible then you can share them and only one person needs to build it right and then everyone else can reuse that build so buildstream 1.6 is the current stable version of BuildStream. That's what the free desktop SDK uses. There's a new version in development, which I'm excited about. And there are many improvements, but one improvement in particular is it standardizes on the remote execution API. This was introduced by the Bazel project, and it gives a standard way to distribute builds across a build farm and a way to cache the results. So the cool thing here is BuildStream and Bazel can work together on the same infrastructure. So if you want to use both tools, you would only need to maintain one build farm and one cache. And I hope that this will become a collaboration point for more build tools in the future. It's an open public standard. Follow that link and you can, you can look at it. So I'd really like to see this or something else, become a collaboration point where builds, we can stop re-implementing build farms and we can all standardize on a, an API. So I mentioned Bazel. You might be thinking, well, why not use Bazel? Actually, they are quite different tools. If you've ever used Bazel or tools like this, you need to rewrite the build system of everything you're going to build. So if you want to build GCC with Bazel, first you have to get rid of auto tools and rewrite the entire build instructions for GCC using Bazel. Good luck. I'll see you in a decade or so. BuildStream operates at a higher level where it reuses the build system that a component already has. So if we're building GCC, for example, we would call into the auto tools build system or we'd call into CMake or Meeson. There are disadvantages and advantages to that, but the big advantage is you don't have to rewrite any build systems. So when you're distributing a lot of open source projects, it's the only option. Apart from that, BuildStream uses a YAML syntax to describe the build instructions. You can write plugins in Python to help you generate different types of output. So for example, Docker images, you can use a Python plugin. And the whole process is tracked in a single Git repository. So that makes it nice and easy to manage with GitLab. Now, before I talk about automation, let me show you a bit of detail about how Freedop SDK uses BuildStream. So this is the Git repo on GitLab that contains all the build instructions and all of the components are here in the elements directory. So let's look at one component of a standard desktop, which is also right, the sound library. And here are the build instructions. Somehow this is taking a while to load. Once it opens, you will see a short YAML document, which contains where to get the source from, what tag to build. Um, maybe if I go back and forwards. Maybe what's happening is there are too many files in this directory for the browser to render. Anyway, once it loads, 
we shall see. Here we go. A simple YAML document with the dependencies needed to build ALSA. You might have runtime dependencies here, but it's a library. So we only have build dependencies. It needs auto tools. It needs Python. Some configuration options. Um, how to install it. How to split the output. And where to get the source code. So it's a page of YAML, and each component is described sort of like that. OK, so that is the ingredients. But we want to build a container image. So let's have a look in the SDK element. This is a different type of element. It's called a stack. And this is a list of everything we want to put in the SDK. So this is all the build tools that the free desktop SDK ships. And here we go, a list of components, nothing fancy here. And if I go into the Flatpak images folder here, I can see an element which defines how to actually put all of those components into the format that the Flatpak tool expects. So this is a special kind of element implemented by a Python plugin. And here is a load of metadata specific to Flatpak. So when you build this and you export it from BuildStream, the output is something you can publish as a Flatpak runtime straight away, which is what we do. And if I go somewhere else, for example, into the OCI folder, somewhere in here, you can see the same thing, but building a Docker image. And that can be pulled into Docker. So that's a very brief overview of how BuildStream works. Uh, I don't have time to go into it in more detail, but BuildStream has a website, buildstream.build, if you want to find out more. The other side of this is the automation. So a goal when implementing the free desktop SDK was that as much as possible should be automated. It should take care of itself as much as possible. And so a series of robots handles most of the work. There's a script to update components whenever there's a new release. So the goal is to stay as close to upstream releases as possible. There's a test pipeline, which runs on feature branches. There's a tool to integrate the different branches and test them. There's another pipeline that runs on the master branch. And all of this is tracked in a Git repository, the same Git repository, and it all runs on GitLab CI. I should say that it's practical partly because there are some fast build machines which are provided by one by the Oregon Open Source Lab and one by Packet. So that's a key as well to making the whole thing work well. There's a lot of building going on. So it's important to have some fast machines. Let me show you how the process works. So this is a GitLab issue. It's a GitLab merge request, which has been opened by a robot, the SDK updater. And you can see it's running a CI pipeline. The change, if we open it, will be very simple. It's just updating the version number in the YAML file. And it triggers the CI pipeline. And once that passes, it can be merged into master. So all it requires is a human to go through the list and see, OK, these updates are ready to merge, and click Merge. Here's a diagram of what the pipeline's doing in more detail. So there's a lot of checking going on behind the scenes, including checking that the source code is mirrored correctly. So that's automated. Um, then a build starts. This can take a while. But any new outputs of the build go to a cache. So things only get built once. Let's say we've updated libgpg error. We now have to rebuild libgpg error and everything that depends on it. But we only do that in one pipeline. The artifacts are sent to a remote artifact cache. And the next time the pipeline runs, it just needs to pull them again. So there's not too much wasted energy here. Once the build completes, the same job runs a test. 
In this case, it tests that Flatpak can build applications against the SDK. That's the goal, right? And if that works, there's also an ABI checker, which uses libabigail. And this doesn't run on the master branch, but on a stable branch, it's very important that there aren't any changes, incompatible changes in the binary interface we provide to applications. And so the pipeline will also fail if any symbols are changed or removed. If all that works, the pipeline goes green. And then what happens? It's actually quite difficult to maintain a repo where the tests are green all the time. If you just press the merge button, you might find that the tests passed against an old version of master, but they don't pass against a new version of master. So the next step is another robot called MargeBot, which takes care of integrating all of the different merge requests. It can take a long time to run the CI. So MargeBot will take maybe three open merge requests, put them into one, see if the tests pass against master. And if they do, it'll merge all three into master. And then it'll take the next three. If one of them fails, it'll back out the change and try and merge a different set and see if that works. So it maximizes efficiency while making sure the tests are green on master at all times. The downside is it can be a little bit slower. If the tests are failing for some reason, then you have a bunch of branches waiting to be merged, but it pays dividends in the long run because you can always trust master. Actually, when things are merged to the master branch, another CI pipeline runs. And this does some more checks. It builds a virtual machine. Actually, that happens in the other pipeline, but I didn't put it in my graph. But it builds a virtual machine, tests that that still boots. And then it publishes some artifacts. So the latest master branch artifacts are published to Flathub. Hopefully not many people are using them because they could be broken, but they're published there in case you need them. And they're published to the container registry. And the CVE reports generated. All of this is done using Buildstream. So the art of the elements that I showed you a few moments ago make it very easy to produce the flatpak images and the container images in a single pipeline and push them every time the pipeline runs. So it's continuous delivery, right? When it comes time, I've missed a slide. When it comes time to make a release, a very similar pipeline runs, but the publish step will go to a different tag. So when there's a commit on a stable branch, it'll be published to the stable tag. And in this case, it will actually go out to users. And hopefully they see whatever bug they had is, is fixed. Perfect. OK, um, I'm going to wrap up very soon. So we've got some time for questions. Let me just talk a little bit about one other benefit of using Buildstream, which is that other projects using Buildstream can reuse the same elements. And this is something that GNOME does. So GNOME is separate from the Free Desktop SDK, but the integration repository maintained by GNOME imports the elements from the Free Desktop SDK and uses them to build the GNOME Flatpak runtime and the GNOME SDK. So if I update a component in the Free Desktop SDK, GNOME sees the same update immediately. And one cool thing that this enables is the same components in the SDK that allow building VM images can be used by GNOME. And this is how we build the GNOME OS VM images. If you don't know, these are testing only images. They're, again, sort of the opposite of a distribution. The goal of a distribution is to have a stable integration of software. The goal of GNOME OS is to have the most broken thing possible, everything master. And that's perfect if you want to test out the latest version of master. It helps developers and designers test their latest changes, but it's not intended for general use. So I want to wrap up by thinking, 
how can other projects benefit from the work that's been done in the free desktop SDK? The SDK project has been ticking over now for several years. As I said, it's got uh, millions of downloads and millions of real world users. And the existing infrastructure maybe can be useful. So maybe we can share the container images and use them as a base for other projects. Maybe the VM images can be useful in other environments. CodeThink has plans to reuse it to build images for embedded devices. That's still in early development, but we hope to be able to reuse the work in the free desktop SDK to create something akin to BuildRoot or, or Yocto. And that's all I've got to say. Let's see if there are any questions. Thank you very much for listening. I'm going to keep sharing my screen, but let's see if any questions appear. There are no, hey, thanks, um, appreciate your talk. There are no comments so far in either Element or YouTube. So I must have covered everything. That's good to know. That's true, yeah. <laughs> going once, going twice. I, I, I think uh, that's it. And I'm pretty sure people can find you on the room for chat later on in Element. Yes, so if you're more interested in the free desktop SDK, here's the link. You can join in Matrix or the mailing list or anywhere. Great. Thanks, Sam. Thank you very much. Goodbye.